we are looking at elders. I didn't even come up with a smart and fancy name for the sermon this morning. I just typed elders as a, as a, as a placeholder, and that's what we've got. We're looking about elders. It's that straightforward. And dear brothers and sisters, it is important for us to talk about this. It's an, this is a heartfelt and pointed message for us today. And now, all preaching should be heartfelt and pointed, yes, I know. But this is a heightened focus for us because this impacts where we're going as a church and what we're doing into the future. God brings about all His plans for His glory, and He uses people like us in the unfolding story, both on, the, on a global scale throughout history, but also in the individual lives that we share together. But how we respond to God's word on this matter will affect the future history of Flooding Creek. Will we be a faithful, healthy, robust church making disciples and proclaiming Christ for a thousand years? Or will we be another failed church plant that leaves behind no trace? Now, God in his providence, when if churches fall over and shut down or whatever, things happen to them in, under God's providence, God's word doesn't fail. But in God's word... There seems to be a link between the faithfulness of Christians and their, and their longevity of their churches, especially in the way that Jesus talks to the churches in the early chapters of Revelation. So it's, a, it's an encouragement to us to be faithful and to work hard because it has an impact for the future. But this morning, if this is not your church home, if you're just visiting with us, uh, no problem. This topic is still hugely important for you. Because whatever church you belong to, you need to be equipped to think about, um, you need to be able to think about your local church well, to be equipped to serve your local context for their mutual building up in Christ. God's people should be led under the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, by under shepherds. And regular church members need to know about biblical leadership just as much as the pastoral candidate needs to know what biblical church leadership is. Because churches keep their elders accountable. They help. Now, before we go any further, I need to make uh, this disclaimer. This disclaimer is that all that we're talking about here is on the foundation of Jesus Christ. What we're, what we're talking about here, uh, even though we're focusing in on this one particular thing, this is not disconnected from who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. The foundations of the church are on Jesus Christ. He is the rock on which this house is built. His apostles delivered to us the gospel message through the power of the Holy Spirit so that each one of us here today might hear the word of God and be called to enter the church through Jesus Christ. We come in by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. The church is God's saved people. The church are the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. The church are the elect ones called out of the world. The church is the flock, the sheep who hear the voice of Christ, who know him and follow him. The church, Christians, are reborn in Jesus Christ by the Spirit for the glory of God. It is from Christ, it is in Christ, and it is for Christ. So all that we're going to talk about over the next little while is on the basis of this truth. Because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about ecclesiology, the you know, church, the way the church is structured and church life. But make no mistake, we're not here to build our own religious systems, to quibble over trivialities. We're not here to make our own name great. We're not here to develop outward-facing religion that looks good. We're here to present everyone mature in Christ. We're here to present Christ to everyone. So the gospel, Christ himself, is at the center of all that we do and all that we are. But, you know, gospel centrality is a, is a modern kind of buzzword and it is a popular thing to talk about. And that's good. It is good to have Christ at the center of all that we do. But the fact that he's at the center means that there is more beyond that. He is the center but he's the center of something. He's the center of our faith. He's the center of our church. And I like to use the example of a, of a wheel. Imagine a wagon wheel, or if you, don't, you can't think back 
to what a wagon wheel looks like. Maybe a bike wheel would do the same trick. That there is a hub at the center of the wheel, and then there are spokes that come out from that, that support the structure of the whole wheel. And so when we talk about being Christ-centered, Christ is the center, is the hub, but there are spokes that come out from that, that hold the whole thing together. And we need to diligently under- search the scriptures to understand what the spokes are meant to look like and see them take shape in our life and faith. And one of those spokes that, ho- that holds the faith together is the nature of church. What is church meant to be like? And as we're looking at that today, it tells us what leadership should look like. And we can't just uh, be afford to sit back and tune out as if this is unimportant to you. You think, oh, it's not a core issue. But wheels don't work without spokes. The church and your personal faith can be terribly damaged if we don't get this right. So without further ado, I've got four points for today, four aspects of elders that the Bible teaches us about. We're going to be sticking mostly... We're mostly hanging out in in Titus, but I am going to be jumping around. I'll put the verses up on the screen so you don't have to continuously be flipping back and forth. So, But if you wanted to keep Titus open, that would probably be helpful for you. So these four aspects flow out of this passage. And this will equip and prepare us as we move forward to establishing a biblical eldership in this local church. The first thing that we see is the need for elders, the need for elders. Many of us take this for granted, of course. If you have some kind of group of people that get, come together, eventually you're going to need some form of leadership to look after them and oversee them. But unfortunately, there are some people who have such a flat view of Christianity that they want to try and explain away biblical leadership. So for the sake of making sure that we have sound doctrine... Even on these rudimentary points, let's consider God's Word. If we go back to the Old Testament, what do we find? We find that God set up spiritual leadership in His people in the nation of Israel. You remember the tribe of the Levites. They proved their holiness and devotion to God's holiness. And so God rewarded them by making them the spiritual clan, the spiritual class in their society. They were spread abroad amongst the people of Israel. And they were to instruct God's people on how they were to worship Him, how they were to follow Him. They were to teach and instruct people on God's covenant. And at times they did a really poor job of that, as that passage from Hosea pointed out, that the priests were not teaching God's people. They were perishing for lack of knowledge. And so God was pouring out his judgment on them. But, putting that aside for a moment, the Levites themselves served in a special capacity as priests at God's temple, to guard God's temple, to protect it, to help people worship God. But Jesus came and fulfilled the priesthood. So we don't need a priesthood anymore in the sense of the Levites. Because Jesus is our great high priest. He is our mediator between God and man. He is the atoning sacrifice. And now we are all a priesthood. We all have a direct access to God if we are in Christ. And we are to lead the world to Jesus. But... God's people still need spiritual leadership to help them know God, worship God, and follow Him rightly after Jesus came in the present age, the the New Testament age and beyond. And now originally, as the New Testament church got started, it was pretty obvious who the leaders were. You had 12 apostles, and they were the guys. They knew Jesus. They were appointed to take the message out and and to establish the church. But then as the church grew it soon became obvious that, well, hang on, there's only 12 apostles and there's churches everywhere. There's churches in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in Damascus, in Antioch, and then further afield. The church grew and grew and grew as God intended it to grow. And 12 guys can only go so far. And so, eventually, the office of elder was created... As, um, as people were converted under Paul's teaching and preaching, they, he would, there would be little groups of believers all over the place as he travelled around and planted churches. But he would also appoint the leaders that they needed. When they had preached the gospel to the city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must 
into the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord into whom they had believed. So Paul has traveled through and planted churches, created these little gospel communities. And then he's had to travel back through on his way back home. And in each of these little churches who've been established perhaps for a couple of years, now he's appointing elders in each of those churches. And, I, and he's going back and encouraging them and building them up. And I believe these things are connected, that Paul is appointing elders and encouraging them and building them up, strengthening them. These, I think that appointing elders is part of that process of strengthening the church. Here we're seeing that after the coming of Christ, there is a new office of, eldership, of leadership called elders. And this is kind of connected to the synagogue model. Paul has basically adapted the synagogue model because after the exile, uh, Jews had spread it all across the known world. And, and so they had basically formed into synagogues, which were like pre-Christian churches where they would get together on the Sabbath, they'd read God's word, they would be teaching and, and singing. And so in those little communities, they had elders who would lead and who would oversee that and guard it and protect it. And so Paul is co-opting this idea that flows out of the synagogue model and using it to set up God's church. And I say Paul is doing that, but I mean that the Holy Spirit is doing that through God's people like Paul. Now, these leadership are called various names. At times, they are called elders. At times, they are called overseers, or another word in English that we use, which means the same thing, is bishop. Or, in, or sometimes, the same group of people are called pastors, which means shepherds. So these are simple words that have been co-opted to apply to God's biblical leadership structures in churches. So they have ordinary meanings. And this makes it hard sometimes to figure out, hang on, is this talking about the official office of something or is it just talking about somebody? Like if you go looking for the word deacon in the Bible, you find people doing deaconing all over the place because deaconing are servants, they're ministers. So there's people all over the place doing um, ministry stuff. But it's hard sometimes to figure out when is this officially talking about the office of deacon. But that's a little aside for you. But so we have these words. We have these words, elder, bishop, or overseer, and pastor, all referring to these same people doing this job. And so although the term elder carries with it the connotation of age and wisdom, the scripture makes clear that the Holy Spirit can bring about wisdom and godliness in people uh, who are younger. And Timothy is a great example of that, who Paul writes the two letters of Timothy to. But this brings me to the point that the way that Paul wrote to Timothy and our man Titus reveals that there is a need for elders too, because Paul gave them express commands to set up elders in the local churches. God gave these pastoral instructions to us to teach us about what God's leadership is meant to look like and how to go about selecting them. And it was so important for Paul to get these leaders set up in these local churches that he left important members of his ministry team behind to do this work. What did it say in the opening of our passage? This is why I left you in Crete, Titus, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So as part of establishing the church on the island of Crete, with these little groups in each town, Titus was to go around and make sure all the local churches in those cities had elders. Just a refresher, if you can't remember off the top of your head where Crete is, uh, this is the Mediterranean. You can see uh, Rome, uh, well, you can see Italy, where, and Rome is up there. You've got Israel down in the bottom corner on this side with... Uh, and, and uh, so Jerusalem, Israel, Judea, all those, those places that are very familiar to us from God's Word. And so Crete is this island here. So it's a, a little island out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, kind of south of Greece. So Titus is living on Crete, serving the church there by getting them all structured, organized, and appointing elders. And so this was important enough for Titus to be sent there to do this instead of other things that he could be doing. We might be thinking, oh, the church needs to grow. Send him out to the, 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 the new mission front, wherever that was by this time. Maybe it was Spain. Maybe it was India. You know, you would think 
get all these people out there, get your resources out there, evangelizing more and more people. But this was important enough that these ministry resources were being dedicated to setting up and strengthening the local churches. So clearly the church needs elders. It was that important. But what do these elders do? What are they for? Well, the scriptures give us plenty of occasions across, especially the pages of the New Testament, to tell us what these leaders do, what their, what their mission is. What is their mission parameters? What is their role? Let's, let's talk from the big and wide down to their specific role. Broad principles to specific principles. Firstly, we know that all leadership is under Christ, whether we're talking about government leadership, whether we're talking about family leadership, whether we're talking about church leadership, it's all under Christ. So Christ has all authority in heaven and earth and he delegates authority to specific people for specific reasons. So that's the big picture. So within the church and church leadership, there was apostles who were appointed, but then there was those further down the line, so to speak, who, the elders who were given by God to the church. And we are told that all the leaders that are given to the church were to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so elders are, are to do this as well. This is the apostles, the elders, the teachers, the evangelists, this was a broad statement that all Christian leaders are doing this, but elders are included in this. It means that they are not doing ministry on behalf of everybody else, but they are here to serve God's body so that everybody, everybody can be built up in ministry. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, not for the appointed leaders to do all the work themselves now how do they go about this how do elders go about this well there's a bit of a clue in the names being elders as we said before leading men with experience and wisdom they are pastors pastors men who shepherd they lead and protect the flock they are overseers they have responsible supervision seeing that all things are done in good order done the right way and we see these, uh, these, qualica sorry, these qualities coming through when Peter writes to the church and encourages elders to serve well. He says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So pastor the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And so Paul also, when he's on his way to prison in Acts, he's going past Ephesus and he gets all the elders in Ephesus to come out and meet him on the way and he has a little impromptu pastor's conference and he instructs them. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So the elders are to care and shepherd the flock that Christ bought with his blood, the church of God. And like good shepherds, pastors lead their flocks to good food and good water. And that means good elders will lead the flock to Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, the water of life, this only source that will bring us eternal life. They're not there to abuse the flock. They're not there to try and uh, get ahead. There's plenty of examples through, um, if you go back and look at the like church history, especially kind of prior to the Reformation and see all the kind of shenanigans that went on where people would try to get appointed to positions of church leadership so they could get a political foothold or so their family could, uh, could get the lands that they wanted or it was used as a mechanism to get ahead, not to serve God's people. God's appointed leaders, they serve the flock. They don't want the privileges and position over and above the care for the sheep. The flock comes first. And yes, it is true that some blessings and honor usually goes along with people being in leadership, but that comes as a, as a bonus, not as the reason, not as the aim of what elders are there for. They are there to serve God and serve his people. Their job is focused on others, their benefit, their protection, their growth. 
and they only are focused on themselves to the extent that they are making sure that they are worth following, that they are an example that is worth following. And that also means that elders don't just look at the verses about eldership for leadership guidance. They're looking at everything that God says so that they're guarding themselves so that they're an example of faithfulness, but also so that they can teach and help the church grow into the fullness of what God calls us to. The fact that elders are to pay careful attention to the flock means they'll be involved in the life of the church and concerned for your welfare. So when I or future leaders of this church ask you probing personal questions, or perhaps when we uh, address specific sins from the pulpit, it's not us picking on you, it's not us being nosy and rubbing your nose in things, it is out of a care and love for you to see you grow in Christ and throw off the sin that entangles. It's how pastors guide the flock. It's a huge part of what elders do being teaching. They are to defend the faith from bad teaching coming in and they are to teach the truth for the building up of God's people, for the benefit of the church. Paul instructs Timothy, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So when Paul had that uh, pastor's conference near Ephesus, he especially warned them that there was going to be false teachers coming into the church and they would need to be on the lookout. They would need to be able to defend the faith. Now, not every uh, elder is going to be a published theologian or have gone to Bible college. Elders must have a deep desire to know God from his word and a yearning to be learning the depths of doctrine. He should have his wits about him enough to be able to identify wonky teaching and have the skills to examine the scriptures and respond. Because there's more and more dodgy teaching arising all the time. You know, we, we say there's nothing new under the sun. It seems like every new wave of weird teaching has a precursor that has come before it. But you don't expect elders to know every single heresy that has ever come across the path of the church. But we want our elders to be so engrossed in God's word that they can identify heresy and false teaching when it comes up and be able to go to the scriptures and see what the scriptures have to say about it. But knowing God's word isn't just about being able to shut down bad doctrine. It's about lifting God's people up in the truth and including being able to rebuke people. Paul tells Titus that the Cretans had a reputation for certain sins. Titus needed to call them out for this. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So, firstly note, it's okay to generalize about people at times. It's okay to say, this group of people has this problem. Um, it's not being racist, it's being realistic. We, the Cretans had a reputation for being this way. And so Titus, in that situation, in that context, at that time, he needed to specifically rebuke them for the sins that were problems for them in their community, in their society. And so when we're looking for elders, we're looking for elders who are self-aware enough to know about the sins of Australians and Victorians and be able to address us where we need to grow, to have the self-awareness from God's Word to point out the things that we need to hear that are blind spots for us. Why? So that we may be sound in the faith. But good teaching and paying attention to the flock eventually leads to church discipline. This is a tool that God has given us for our spiritual growth, and it starts out very organically and uh, very normally. When somebody does something wrong, you go and say, hey, mate, that was wrong, and God, uh, that's, a, that's a sin, essentially, and call them to repent. And so, this is God's blessing to us that we would be calling one another out so that we don't fall into the temptation of sin, we don't fall under the deceitfulness of sin. And so it's a good thing. But the, the issue becomes when we don't listen. When somebody says, hey, God's word says this, and you're, not, you're doing something different, 
then we're starting to reveal that we have a hard heart. And if the issue is escalated enough, then eventually the church puts you outside the church and says, hey, because of the way you're living, you're demonstrating you don't belong to Jesus, and so you're going to be put outside the church. Now, what does elders have to do with this process? Well, basically, elders eventually have to oversee this process. If they're rebuking people and calling them to live faithfully, and they're overseeing everything, eventually they will have to be involved in situations like this. Elders can, will also be involved in overseeing disputes. Paul teaches us that there are some things that should be dealt with in church, not 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 crimes, like, but there are some things that churches need to be able to deal with internally. Disputes between brothers and sisters needs to be dealt with internally. And as Paul says, if we're going to be judging angels, surely we should be able to deal with the everyday matters that we come up against as human beings in this world. But elders will be involved in overseeing that and helping those things get resolved. So generally, elders are involved in church order and being seeing that everything is done decently, even if they're not directly involved in something. But anybody who becomes an elder needs training in the stuff that we've talked about. And so we're going to be I'm going to be talking more about this stuff in more detail in the leadership classes that we're doing in the future. And any elders who are appointed here at our church will have ongoing training to help them to understand how this all works out from the scriptures. I could say more on the role of elders, but we don't want to be here all morning. So just to recap, we need elders. Elders have a particular mission to protect and guide the church. But what are the qualifications for elders? You only need to look around at the world today and you will see the latest failure in church leadership. What high-profile pastor has been accused of fraud this week? What uh, celebrity pastor has been caught in an affair? Which church has just been trying to cover up another scandal? It's a bit of a cliche at this point. Now, all leaders are sinners and there's no guarantee that any leader won't mess up big time. But if we follow the guidelines from God's word about how to appoint leaders, then we, then we severely reduce the possibility that we're going to have leaders who walk away from the faith or who have these big glaring sin issues that get covered up. God put down these guides for our health and protection and prosperity. So we should follow them for the health of his church. The perennial temptation of churches is to appoint people who present themselves well they have their hair combed the right way and they wear the nice clothes and they have a charismatic personality that just people are attracted to and people love to listen to. But that's not what God says. That's not what the qualifications that God gives for how to appoint pastors. Too often you will have a young person who has really just discovered the faith or really just been awoken in their faith and you see their passion and their zeal and their love to grow and learn from God's word and then we take them and go, oh, wow, this, this person would be great because we have this opening in leadership and they just get shoehorned in there because they're passionate, but actually they're not ready for it. We need to appoint people based on what God's Word says the qualifications are. What are there's a couple lists of qualifications, but we're looking at Titus today. So it says, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but, a hosp but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. So you see this list here, this, this laundry list of qualifications, some of the positive side, some of the, the negative side. But what Paul is presenting here is not anything beyond what every other man is called to do. This, is, should, be a, this should be the way that every godly man is. But perhaps, you know, you, perhaps you don't have the ability to teach. That's probably not the one thing that not every man is going to have, but everything else in here should be a, a, the characteristic of your life. 
And so in that sense, we should have, as a, any, as a church, we should have a huge pool of people as candidates for eldership because they fill this model. I'm not going to go through every detail here, but let's just get the, the cliff notes. He's going to have a good reputation. That is, he's not known for swindling people. He's not known for being um, a bad guy. He's a one-woman man. That is, he's faithful to his wife, both in real life indeed, but as Jesus teaches us, the thought life is just as important. So, one-woman man in life and in thought. His house is in order with believing kids who aren't insubordinate. It means they've been taught They've been instructed, they've been given the appropriate discipline throughout their growing up. And they aren't, uh, de- it, what was the word there? His kids are, I just lost it. They're not open to the charge of debauchery. And this carries with it the idea of like uh, throwing stuff away, being wasteful. So if you think of the prodigal son who goes away and just squanders his father's fortune, he would be he would be a, de- a What's the word? Debauched? (laughs) He would be open to the charge of debauchery. So, an elder's kids aren't wild, but they are faithful believers. And in some sense, you see, well, what has that got to do? Like, yes, we know that, that God saves people, not us, and so we can't make our kids saved. But we're looking here for a pattern. Is the pattern here that that people are made disciples and grow in discipleship in this guy's house? Or is the pattern that they grow wild and wander away from the faith? Is, is this, if, if this guy can't manage his own household well, why on earth would you put him in charge of God's household? They're not drunkard, violent, greedy for gain, you know, but in the opposite, they're self-controlled, they're lovers of good and they're upright and holy. So this is a pattern. This should be characteristic. This isn't to say that uh, an elder is never going to get unrighteously angry or they're never going to um, find themselves uh, fighting off greed or lust. But what this does mean is these things will characterize the God's, the, the, the characterize the leaders in God's church. But you see here again how he ends with how important it is that these leaders are able to teach. They're able to know and hold to doctrine and be able to teach and defend it. That's not to say they're going to be online bullies or they're going to be abusive and arrogant when it comes to talking about God's word. But something that this list doesn't mention that I'll just pull up from Timothy is that this person must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. So this person isn't, hasn't just become a believer recently. And this is something that happened in my last church. We had somebody who was um, only been a believer for a short period of time before they went into, uh, they studied, they went to Bible college, which was fine. They were studying God's word. But then they were appointed to a position of leadership. And it all seemed fine for a few years. And then it all fell apart. Uh, probably a really famous example of this is Mark Driscoll, if I can name names. Somebody who was an incredibly gifted preacher who took on leadership before he had ever even been a member of a church. He became puffed up with conceit and refused correction. And now he hasn't uh, fallen outside the faith, but he is certainly an object lesson of what it looks like when somebody is a recent convert who becomes puffed up with conceit. And so we're looking for people who have grown mature over time. And we aren't expecting every, uh, the elder who's, who's going to be sinless, they're not reached a perfect state of sinless before they become an elder, but this should be their characteristic. They should be maturing. They should be the example of what people are aiming for. This sh- so we need elders. Elders have a particular mission to protect and guide the church, and elders need to be characterized as examples of Christian men. And lastly, we have to appoint them. We have to appoint elders. Now, how do we go about putting them in place? Let's say we see a guy, look, that is elder material. How do we go from him being a candidate to being an elder? Well, let's go back. 
Paul, and, Paul went through, he appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting. They committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So that's probably a key there, that there's prayer and there's fasting involved in appointing elders. But then back to Titus again, I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And so this word appoint that appeared in both of those verses, sometimes it's translated as the word ordain. They're ordained to this position. So that's where that word comes from. Appointed is probably a word that we are more familiar with. But this word implies choosing. This person has to be chosen for this job. It's not something that you can put yourself into. You have to be chosen. But who does the choosing? Well, there's been different uh, ways that people have gone with that throughout church history. Some people think it should be choosing from the top down, that existing leaders or in, in the church hierarchy of some description chooses who becomes the next uh, leaders in God's church. And some people have a bottom-up way of thinking and go, well, it's only God's people who have decisions. They, only they have the power to make this decision about who leads them. But I think when we look at the example in Acts and when we look at church history, we see that I think it's meant to be a bit of both. It's meant to be people like Titus organising and arranging it all, but that God's people have some role to play in terms of putting these people forward and endorsing them. Like they did in Act 6 with the proto-deacons, they were to choose men from among themselves and put them forward to say, hey, we want these men to lead this ministry work. So we don't get explicit commands on the process, but it's implied that there's existing leadership that oversees it, and that the church collectively should put forward people. And this is what we want to do as a church, that the body endorses certain people for appointment through a vote, and the existing elders oversee the process. And if we go back to the earliest church book of order that we have, the earliest church manual that we have, the Didache, it specifically says, appoint for yourselves, therefore, bishops and deacons worthy of the Lord, men who are meek and not lovers of money, and true and approved. For unto you they also perform the servants of the prophets and teachers. Therefore, despise them not, for they are your honourable men among, along with the prophets and teachers. So we see that it is God's people who are collectively working together, leadership and uh, regular church members alike. But as we think about who we're going to appoint, I've got a hot tip for you. And that is from Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So as we think about who we're going to appoint, you're appointing people that you, under God, are obliged to obey and submit to. So we want to appoint people that are going to be a joy to submit to. Is this person going to represent Christ well? Could I submit to this person under Christ with joy? Or is it going to be a drag because of who they are and their character? And obviously, if we're meeting all those other characteristics, I think that we will be finding people who it's a joy to work with and submit under. Some couple last things to think about with appointing elders. It is okay to aspire to the office. Although you cannot put yourself in the job, it is okay to desire that. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. They're not going to, you're not to do it out of compulsion. You get to do it willingly. It's a good thing to want, not for personal gain, but to want to serve the Lord this way. So it's okay to want it. It's not okay to put yourself in that position. And it's not okay to want it for selfish gain. But there is a warning that goes along with this. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. I don't think that God is saying here when he says judged with greater strictness that somehow there is different levels of justice. But I think what he's saying here is that you're, because you are representing God, you are, there is a, there is a higher weightiness to it. It's, it's about taking God's name in vain. So the bad theology would say elders are held to a higher standard of character. No, elders are held to the same standard of character that applies to everybody. 
but a good way to say it, I think, would be to say that elders should not take God's name in vain. That is, stand up and represent Christ to his people and then go and be something different, to be double-minded about representing God, to represent him in a position of authority and then, and then undermine it with the rest of our life, to be hypocrites because we'll be judged for that hypocrisy. We judge with the greater strictness. So what do we do with all this information, this download of all this stuff that the Bible says about elders? I have a couple of things for us to do. The first thing for us to do is to pray, to ask Jesus to give his church holy and staunch leaders who are models worth following, who are strong in the faith, who are weapons with God's word, who will care for the flock and defend it from wolves. The second thing to do is that if you are a man who has aspirations for eldership, let's put those aspirations to work. Let's test you. One of the first things that you could do is come along to leadership classes. In the next uh, month, we're looking at the leadership of self and the leadership of uh, um, government. But then we're going to be honing in and we're going to be looking at family leadership. And then in the future, again, we're going to be looking at church leadership in great detail. So let's put those aspirations to work. And I didn't write anything about this, but it's just occurred to me a reminder to, that God's leaders are servant leaders, that they are willing to be humble. That means that if somebody wants to serve God's people, then we would expect them to be doing that already in humble ways, that we would see an example of their faithfulness and the, the way that they serve those around them. If I could be uh, crude about it and say, if you're not willing to stack chairs and serve, morning, um, serve people cups of tea, then there's no way that you should be willing to stand up here because we want people who have a servant heart to serve God's people in whatever way they can, but then be willing to take the weighty responsibility of stepping behind pulpits. If you're a long-time attender and you have a vested interest in seeing God's church here grow, then please commit to joining our church and in, add your voice to the voices that are endorsing elders and putting them forward so that you can encourage and build up God's church here, even through the, the technical side of having votes and electing people. But fourthly, I want you to start consider who you could encourage to stand for appointment. Is there somebody that you know and you say, yes, I would love to, to see you um, serving God this way. I think you meet the characteristics and uh, encourage them to, to move that way. Perhaps then they're 80% of the way there and they need to, to grow that extra eight, 10, 20% to get there. But we want to be encouraging people to be moving that direction, regardless of whether or not they're standing for eldership. But that is something that can come on the cards down the track. So who would you want to put forward to be considered for eldership? Who's going to be a joy to live with and serve with and to have as a spiritual authority in the church? Those are those four things. Ask God, Jesus, to give his church leaders. Put your aspirations to leadership to work. Commit to God's people so that you can help them move forward. And start considering who you would can encourage to stand for appointment. So let's start with that list right now by asking Jesus to give his church leaders. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have saved a people for yourself. That you have founded us on, the, on Jesus Christ, the rock, the cornerstone. That you've delivered us the good news down to, through the ages to us here and now by the work of your apostles and the power of your Holy Spirit bringing to us the gospel, establishing and growing your church even here in Sale. We pray, Lord, for our local body, that you would keep us healthy, that you would build us up, that you would make us a light to the world. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us leaders that help us to fulfill what you've called us to do. Please, Lord, show us those men. Bring them across our path equip them who are not there yet but please Lord show us so that we might set them aside for this special weighty task Lord for those of us who already stand 
and uh, serve as leaders. Please, Lord, protect us from hypocrisy. Please, Lord, protect us from uh, calling on you and, 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 and using your name in vain. Please, Lord, strengthen and sanctify your church for your name in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.